This episode of the Get Fast podcast is brought to you by Tri Velo Coaching, where we help triathletes and cyclists like you train smarter to race faster. You are joined as always on every podcast by your hosts. We have former Australian Ironman champion, Jared Donnelly, and I am Jordan Donnelly. On this episode of the podcast, we are really excited because we have another member of the Donnelly family joining us. We have the middle brother of the Donnelly family, Matt. Uh, Matt Donnelly is a physiotherapist. He's been working as a physiotherapist for the last 10 years or eight to 10 years. Um, and he is an in-house physiotherapist at Trivello Coaching. And he is currently studying a postgraduate study in musculoskeletal physio- physiotherapy. And most importantly, we actually turn to Matt uh, and Matt provides us with a lot of research articles and knowledge on athletic performance injury uh, and today's topic which we're really excited to dive into uh, is cramping uh, cramping is something that is a really big uh, problem for a lot of endurance athletes it's something that uh, causes a lot of confusion and a clarity can really help uh, with this issue and uh, it's a pretty crazy topic to talk about as you'll find out in the episode but i absolutely love this episode because um, the conversations that we have matt outside of uh, the podcast have been really helpful for you and I, Dad, in terms of our own personal experience with cramping. And we want the listeners to be able to hear the same thing if they're experiencing cramps themselves. So what did you like about the episode? Um, yeah, look, Matt always brings a uh, really good theory to the table. Um, and he's a person who's always been a very well-read, even when I was a little boy, he, he was reading while you guys were playing games. He was in the corner reading and finding out about stuff. And and, you know, before the internet came along, Matt was the internet in our family. He, he could answer almost everything. And um, it, it's, been, it's been something that's been valuable to me and to yourself uh, in, in, you know, in all aspects of training and exercise, um, asking Matt for advice on certain things because he does do so much research. Um, and he's, he's had so many experiences with uh, different sorts of athletes over the journey that he's uh, he's been a physio and um and yeah it's, it was that to me was what uh, i really enjoyed about this episode was um him really uh, cutting out all the myths um giving us clarity on what is happening with cramping um what's causing it um and what are the things we could possibly try but there's no evidence to, to say that these are solutions uh, these things work for, for you and i we've got strategies um and Matt's helped us to formulate these over the journey, and uh, and yeah, I'm really grateful to him for his uh, his knowledge and his expertise in this area, and uh, and it really it made me quite shocked to see that, that you know we really don't understand cramping um, from a scientific point of view very much at all, and and Matt that's Matt's real real summary is that there's so much more to learn in this field because uh, no one's got a good gra- gra- grasp of uh, what's actually happening. Absolutely. Um, so without further ado, we'll get let, let you get into the episode. It was a really good one. And like you said, Matt is the academic of the family. So we can't wait for you to hear this one. Uh, it was a beauty. Without further, further ado, here is Matt. So Matt, another member of the Donnelly family joins us on the podcast. We're slowly ticking it off. I think slowly we're going to get every member of the family on here at one point or another. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Start by introducing yourself a little bit and your background with sport and physiotherapy. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on, guys. Um, So I've been a physio for the last eight years, working in and out of uh, different hospital organisations based around Melbourne. Uh, Obviously grew up loving cross-country and athletics and all the other sports that Dad got us to do growing up. Um, Really interested in muscle injuries and muscle stuff. Uh, There's lots of different fields you can get into in physio, but I'm definitely the stereotypical physio that everybody thinks of when they think of physio. So I deal with muscle injuries, bone injuries, tendon injuries, and I'm actually doing a bit of study uh, back at uni, doing some postgrad study in muscle stuff, which is pretty exciting. Awesome. So one of the main topics we wanted to talk about today uh, is cramping. And there are a wide range of topics we could talk about with uh, musculoskeletal injury and performance. Uh, But often we find ourselves, us three, talking about cramping and it's a really common issue in endurance sports. So Uh, We're going to dive straight into that uh, because it's a pretty wild topic and it's, uh, as you would say, relatively, uh, everything's kind of relatively unproven with cramping. So why why don't you start off by talking to us about, you know, what cramping is? Well, as its basic definition, uh, there's actually three types of cramping that are talked about in literature. So there's obviously the unexplained night cramping and there's some cramping that's associated with different diseases like diabetes and things. But the one that 
I'm really interested in, we're going to talk about today is exercise associated muscle cramp, which is its own specific thing they talk about in the scientific research. And so they define that as a painful or involuntary contraction of muscle, which occurs immediately after or during exercise. And there's a little bit to unpack there, if you don't mind me going into it in a bit more detail. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, to start off with, like, it's really important to understand how do muscle contractions work in the first place. So uh, it's not actually something we think about in a lot of detail, but if you're um, taking a stride when you're running or pushing through the bike, your brain has to send individual signals to every single muscle in your leg to do that action. And it's not something you're doing con consciously. It's happening constantly at an unconscious level, but there are neural signals going from your brain to your muscles. And so it's thought that cramping is associated with um, an alteration of those signals or those signals not quite working the way they're meant to. Would, would that be uh, the muscle sending messages back to the brain or is it the brain depicting something happening in the muscle uh, activity? It's both. So there's that constant feedback loop that they need to communicate with each other and talk to each other. And there's two different types of signal pathways that happen. There's the excitatory impulses, which tell your muscles to contract. And then there's the inhibitory impulses, which tell them, oh, don't co contract that much. Because if you're thinking about running, uh, you're not contracting your calves, hamstrings, and quads 100% with every stride. It's balanced. You've got to, um, depending on how fast you want to run or what pace you want to run it, you're going to contract your muscle to a certain extent, but it's not going to be that 100% maximal possible force you can possibly produce. Because um, you have to have that balance when you're doing a task as well between the muscles that propel you forward and the muscles that control you and stop you from going out of control. So, for example, if you think about when you're running and you straighten your knee to take that next stride forwards, obviously your quads have to contract, but at the same time, your hamstrings have to contract to make sure that your knee doesn't go flying out uncontrollably in front of you. So there has to be that balance between the two muscles. And so it's that uh, neural drive that's coming from your brain, how to define how much each muscle contracts or relaxes. And it's actually a really fine balance. And that's something that we, uh, train over many, many, many years to get better at a skill. So getting back to the question of what is cramping. So, so there's many reasons why the muscle and the brain decide to stop you from exercising and cramping is, is that end result, isn't it? Um, yeah, there's lots of different factors that can contribute to cramps and there's a lot of myths around, uh, what causes cramps as well. Um, so, so can we, just before we get to the myths, can we just establish what is the cramping? Yeah, it's the involuntary contraction. So it's when um, the neural signals get mixed up and your muscle spasms and contract, contracts at full force when it's not meant to and you're not wanting to. Great. So that little spasm that I, for example, get whilst I've done a big day session and I can sit on the couch and I can just see my, my calves involuntarily twitching. Mm. And that, that is generally the precursor to what's going to happen in the next five minutes, which is I'm going to get a massive cramp in my calf. Yep. Is, is that, is that sort of some of the pathway indicated? Yes. Well, um, cause cramps can happen up to eight hours after a really intense exercise session. Um, they can happen, right at the end. And in fact, they're most common uh, towards the end of a race or towards the end of a footy match or a soccer match or something. Uh, they never happen at start. Um, and depending on the person, because your genetics can influence how severe they are or uh, how intense they are, um, you can still hours after you finish a race have cramping, depending on the person and depending on what you've done. So Matt, that establishes what cramping is. It's involuntary muscle contraction. Uh, and if you've ever had a cramp, then you know it's totally involuntary because you jerk and, <laughs> and it yeah. really shocks you. Um, so based on the fact that you're saying it's, it's a neurological almost malfunction, it's your muscle cramping when, or your, your brain telling your muscle to cramping when it shouldn't, you know, why do we think it's um, so nutrition based then? Or I mean, start by telling me what, what are the causes of cramping? Because a lot of the yeah, sure. perception out there is that it's nutrition. I guess I've been probably jumping a little bit ahead. So if we're taking the pure definition of cramping, it's just that it's an involuntary contraction and it's as simple as that. And that's uh, 
as clear as the research gets. And from there, it gets really, really murky and there's actually not a lot of clarity around it. So uh, the theory that I've been talking about so far is the neuromuscular fatigue theory, which is probably the one that's got the most evidence behind it for what causes muscle cramping. Uh, the other theories are a bit more well known. So the idea that dehydration causes cramping, which is pretty well refuted by now. Um, and the second theory, which is all about electrolytes and electrolyte imbalances causing cramps. And again, that has a lot of very weak evidence surrounding it. And uh, certainly when I've listened to sports doctors giving lectures and presentations, uh, dehydration and electrolytes causing cramp is pretty out now. Um, they're really thinking that neuromuscular fatigue is what causes cramp uh, nowadays, although there is lots more research that needs to be done in this field. And there's lots of things that they still don't know about cramping. Which is surprising because anecdotally, if you speak to a lot of endurance athletes, uh, they will have felt that when they re replace their electrolytes or their salt level, the cramps seem to go away. And so that, that, that might be where that uh, conception comes from. Yeah, perhaps. But certainly when they've tried to do that in uh, randomized control trials, they found it makes absolutely no difference. So, so what are you saying, Matt, that it's the muscle just getting fatigued from the same action over and over again that, that can't sustain it due to what other factors yeah and fatigue in of itself is a really interesting uh thought to unpack because what what contributes to fatigue what things make fatigue worse so for example we know that exercising in a hot humid conditions is going to make you more fatigued we know that uh stress and psychological well-being is going to lead to increased fatigue uh, if it's in the negative spectrum we know that increased exercise intensity or duration is going to lead to more fatigue uh, inadequate conditioning or inadequate, inadequate preparation before a race is going to lead to further conditioning and uh, faster fatigue. And it's really all those factors put together that make you fatigue faster in a race than you might otherwise do. So, so just to be a little bit controversial, so, you know, if you didn't drink or fuel in an endurance sport, you're going to tell me that that'll be okay. Um, and it's not a, contributing factor to cramping well because we're talking about um obviously you need fuel to exercise and you need nutrition and water and fluid to exercise and that's totally a separate issue to cramping because if you haven't got the energy stores to run it doesn't matter if you're cramping or not you won't finish the race and there's no way you can get through an iron man without adequate nutrition and adequate hydration however those things don't have any impact on cramping so that's a really good point to make and and it, we're not sitting here saying that you don't need to fuel and and have hmm. you know the, the, the right nutrition and a lot of electrolyte level a lot the right uh, hydration level that's not what we're saying and hmm. and, and that, that has to be made really um you know the evidence is saying that that's not the link to cramp but that's obvious that you need that in endurance yeah course. Yeah, because if you could think about, and even you can uh, break down fatigue into peripheral fatigue or central fatigue. So peripheral fatigue being, obviously your muscles are working hard. They're producing chemicals, they're burning glycogen, they're breaking down other different bits and pieces, producing lactic acid. So uh, in order to help manage that, you need adequate uh, glycogen stores. You need adequate energy levels. Um, you're obviously sweating constantly during a race and uh, um, you've raced in Hawaii before, you know how brutal the heat can be. And don't tell me you uh, could have done that without having a drink of water once during that race. Mm, the hydration is just so important and so is the fueling. They're two, they're two separate entities anyway. But, but mm. just getting back to the cramping. So, so the repeated um, uh, continuous such as running, exercise such as running, such as swimming, such as... Mm pedaling you know you're just you're using the same muscle groups repeatedly mm. in an endurance sport and and i know myself if i if i go high explosive efforts repeatedly in 10 minutes i could possibly bring on a cramp and it doesn't yeah. have to be endurance that's yep. that's one of the things i'm really interested in because i have been in a short hard or high intensity criterium and in the mm. 10 minute mark i've sustained a cramp yeah so, I and in the research they've done, and they've actually done a couple of uh, studies in Ironman athletes, which is awesome. It's uh, cramping is associated with higher intensity uh, exercise. And even it's really interesting if you took athletes that say they did a faster race time, then their previous PB were more likely to cramp 
or athletes that maybe had come into the event a bit under conditioned compared to what they normally would be were more likely to cramp. Uh, the other thing that uh, a history of cramping uh, made you more likely to cramp as well. So there's probably some people out there who are maybe a bit more genetically disposed to cramping than others. Uh, even things like uh, your height and weight may have an impact uh, from one study they looked at. And, or if you've had previous injuries or if you've had uh, previous tendon or muscle issues, then that might increase your risk as well. But the main thing is uh, that association between high intensity exercise and fatigue leading to cramp. So, so a weakness in the muscle and unable to be doing repeated efforts at, at high intensity is going to expose a weakened muscle. Is that one of the things you're saying? Yeah, well, to contract a muscle, you need adequate neural drive. You need to get those messages from your brain to your muscle. And the more uh, rehabbed or trained a muscle is, the more efficient those signals are going to go from your brain to your muscle. It's that idea of um, neuroplasticity, being able to train your brain to do stuff. And the more you train your brain to do something, the better it gets at spitting out those signals repeatedly. It's why... Uh, the things like the 10,000 hour rule exist, how the more you practice something, the better you get at it. So someone who's practiced uh, running in a, a triathlon for years and years and years worth of training, their muscles are going to be finely tuned to receiving those inputs from their brain about what they're meant to be doing. Now, uh, I would consider you, Jared, a very finely tuned athlete, but you still cramp when you do stuff that pushes you beyond your limits. Like when you raced, uh, what was the event? You did 250 Ks in one day. Yeah, how can you forget, Matt? It was <laughs> I, couldn't remember, I couldn't remember the name. What was it called? Good morning. You were sitting in the car for seven hours behind me. You've got I was. That, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the race vividly. I just mental blanked on the name. <laughs> so, yeah, when you were racing Warner Bull, yes, you are an incredibly fit athlete, but how many times a year do you ride 270 kilometers? Yeah, not a great deal. But the point you were making before is I've never ridden the first hour and a half at my highest intensity and that was the, the mm. reason and you've hit it on the on the head um you know i i sustained massive cramps at at 100k mm. uh, because my first 100k was riding with you know the nrs elite riders of australia and and i'm a 60 year old trying to ride my tempo but <laughs> you know which is going to cause some issues yep. uh, and it clearly did um, yep. So it's a really good example you've given. Uh, hmm. But on that note, I mean, you agree that dad is a um, highly trained athlete and um, you called him Jared before and we, we can call him dad on this podcast. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he is a highly trained athlete. So why is he still getting, you know, calf cramps um, when it's not a, I mean, Warner Bull is an extreme example, but dad, you hmm. would just do an endurance ride or something and, or do a criterium and get calf cramps that night sitting on the couch. So yeah, um, it can, there's, I would say it's linked back to the fatigue element as well. And uh, just because you're uh, used to training doesn't mean that particular session, you didn't push yourself maybe beyond what you have done recently. Maybe your uh, accumulated fatigue from the last couple of weeks of training has built up because you know that training load does contribute to overall fatigue. And that's why we train in blocks rather than just smash you harder and harder and harder for 12 months straight. You need to have rest breaks. You need to have periods where uh, you settle down your training a bit. Um, the other, thing to, the other thing to consider, uh, sorry, Dad, is age. Uh, as you get older, you're more likely to cramp. Oh, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh, my next... I cramped as a 27-year-old. And I'm cramping, <laughs> cramping the same. The history thing you said before, mm. genetic um, history of cramping, um, I'm intrigued about that. Um, mm. What do you that mean was my next question. That was my next question as well, because I, is, is there uh, in the literature a strong link genetically? Because the experience dad talks about with his calf, I mean, I sent you a video of my calf doing the exact same thing, Matt. Um, mm. I don't really want to hear that it's genetic. You know? <laughs> oh, it's not, it's not very strongly proven. It's more that, because um, the way they do these research things is they make people fill out pages and pages worth of surveys. And they found that people who have a history of cramping are more likely to cramp. And so the people that have cramped their whole lives are more likely to cramp after an event, which you would conclude means that there's got to be some kind of genetic involvement. What that is or what it looks like, I haven't found any concrete answers how that works. So it's obviously still a work in progress, but 
it does seem to be that if you cramp lots before, you're probably predisposed to cramping lots in the future, unfortunately. That brings us to a really good point, part of the conversation that I really just want to clarify this. And you've said this to me many times in conversations, Matt, and I just want to really make this point is that you said before, you know, we can establish what cramping is uh, as, as a definition, uh, it's involuntary muscle contraction. Um, but apart from that, everything gets pretty murky. And I think that's a really important yeah. point yeah. to reiterate is that the rest, we really don't really know, do we? No, not at all. So there's, Lots of really good research that's coming out. And so this is where this neuromuscular fatigue argument is coming from, that this is probably the best evidence we have so far. But I think what people, um, and this always surprised me when I'm doing research or I'm doing further study, is there's so many areas of the human body that we just don't know enough about. And um, even the leaps and bounds we've taken in medicine in the past 20 years versus the last two centuries of medical research. Like we're always learning stuff. We're always learning new things. And so this is our best guess so far, but uh, it might be proven to be total crap in 50 years. We don't know, but I think there's definitely some merit in the arguments that people are putting forward for this theory. And I think it makes sense in practice. So I'm really happy to talk about it more now and talk about uh, how we can use it to, examine our training, examine our race days and uh, use that as a bit of an idea of what we can do about it. it it's so interesting, this whole area, and especially when I've, ha I've been at the history of, of a cramper, um, and it's, you know, it's nothing more frustrating and infuriating to be, to be well prepared in every aspect of your, of your race preparation and for you to be prevented from executing what you want to do because of uh, a cramp. And, and it's debilitating. You can't continue, you know, you know, there's been examples of people having to pull out because of cramping. Mm. Um, and, you know, one of the things, you know, you experienced with me and you and I have talked about this a lot and we've experimented on myself in training since those, those events was, uh, we talk about that in, in a minute, you know, how do we prevent cramp? Um, but we've experimented already with, uh, with changing a few things, the neuromuscular pathway from the brain to the muscle. Um, but, but the thing I'm sort of saying here is, um, you know, there's things that we can, we can control and there's things that we can't. And it seems like uh, the cramping is something that's really out of our control. And we can only concentrate on nutrition, electrolyte, being fitter, uh, training at higher intensity than the event would probably require. And, and that's one of the things that I found out if we just keep taking the water ball as an example and and if i use kona um the year where i was possibly going to finish in the top five or six and cramp got me with literally 3k to go um you know the intensity of that event was above what i'd been doing ever in my life before um so that that's an example of the same with the water ball the intensity of that event was above what i'd trained at and, mm. and so what I'm trying to get across is there are things we can do about it. Hmm. We don't have evidence that tell us that that's right or wrong, but, but you know, from the experimenting that I'm doing, it definitely is proving to me that there's, there's training above what the expectation of the level of intensity of the race is going to prevent that from rearing its head when it really matters. Remote. Well, it comes back to common sense training principles. So if you know that you've got to have a certain level of fitness to complete a big race or um, do well in a big race, then you need to train for that level. Um, and if you're not prepared for an event when it comes up and you try and push yourself harder than you possibly can, you're going to struggle. So uh, for example, um, the Puffing Billy fun run, which is 14 K is really popular fun run for lots of people to do, but it's 14 Ks of hills. And so if you're not uh, if you, for an amateur athlete who doesn't run a lot, if the longest distance you've ever run is 5k and you try and enter that event, you're going to struggle. Um, there's just no way of getting around that. Um, and so when it comes to this other stuff like you're doing um, or, or the other big races, your preparation is so important. So let's circle that back to um, now that we know um, that there's lack of evidence for exactly what causes it. Um, mm. What do we know? And you said this before, what do we know? Are actual myths uh, and you said that uh, there are some things that evidence shows dehydration really um, strongly doesn't uh, doesn't cause it and we know that yeah yep so for example the idea that uh, electrolyte loss causes cramp is uh, pretty well 
uh, debunked as a theory. And so uh, sport drinks and electrolyte drinks might help you recover your energy levels, but they're going to do absolutely nothing for cramping. Um, but just stop you there. Yeah. That, is, that is a necessary part of an endurance or any sporting activity. You need to continually replace those things as you're losing them. So we're not, we're not saying not to do that in your event yeah. or in your training. We're saying yeah. it just doesn't relate to cramping. That's the yeah. only thing. That's right. And things, uh, they've looked into other supplements like uh, magnesium. So for example, bananas are a really popular home idea for treating cramp. Also has no evidence. Um, might be really good, for, again, for restoring your energy levels at a halftime break in a footy game, uh, having something to get your energy levels going again. Or bananas are still an incredibly popular snack in ten elite tennis matches around the world and even in the Australian Open when we used to work there. But uh, is it going to do anything for cramping? The research says no. Pickle juice is another one we've experiment, experimented with. <laughs> yeah, I was reading about that. Uh, again, um, yeah, not a lot of evidence to suggest that it's going to be helpful. Anecdotally, though, there is, there is so much uh, experience of athletes um, mm. literally getting the pickle juice to touch their lips. And this is the theory behind it anyway. And mm. their cramp goes away. So, Well, it's really interesting. I was reading a nutrition article from this year and I was thinking, because originally they were thinking the pickle juice was related to certain uh, proteins and things they were looking at um, and electrolyte related things but they were actually thinking it wasn't necessarily the electrolytes. It might've been a very, very specific acid that happens to be in pickle juice and happens to be in a couple of other products. And that may or may not help. They couldn't really find conclusive evidence either way. So that's why that one is a little bit more interesting than your electrolyte drinks. But it, again, it has nothing to do with electrolytes. It might have to do with some other random chemical that they're still looking into, but um, yeah. Uh, your Gatorades and your power raids aren't going to do anything for cramp. So we talked about the brain sending messages and that cycle between the muscle, the brain and, and working backwards and forwards and basically talking to each other. Mm. Um, you and I have trialed this and we're suggesting that uh, the research is telling us about um, changing the pathway where we, we're trying to stop the brain to send a message to the muscle to cramp because the brain is, is sending a message to say, you've overdone it. I'm to going to stop you from getting injured by giving you a cramp. And, and we're experimenting that with trying to break that pathway. Mm. I'll, 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 I'll unpack that a little bit more. So for example, when we think of pain and when we think of fatigue, we think of them in terms of protective mechanisms and we think of them in terms of okay, if I were to push myself to my absolute maximal limit, completely ignoring pain, um, there's a risk I might hurt myself. I might do a muscle injury. I might uh, do a tendon injury or something. So we sometimes need a healthy amount of um, sensory input from our body telling us what's going on and saying, oh, this is, I'm, I'm stuffed. I probably shouldn't push this hard. Otherwise I'm going to hurt myself or otherwise I'm going to do some damage. And it's really interesting because uh, pain isn't, necessarily associated with actual damage it can be associated with uh, potential damage or resembling tissue damage so uh, there's this uh, constant back and forth with your brain trying to figure out is this too much or is this okay and so if you've analyzed the situation and you're looking at yourself going yes i'm cramping but otherwise uh, uh, the warnable race is a really good example you cramped in the first hundred kilometers and you said okay Clearly, I'm overdoing it. I'm pushing way too hard. I can't keep this up for another 170 kilometers. I need to back off a bit. And so you dropped off the back of those um, young, young guys who are in the elite teams from around the world, and your race became much more manageable. And so that warning signal that's going off in your brain saying, this is too much, this is unsustainable, backs off because you've made adjustments, you've adapted to your environment. And even um, if we're thinking about how you can respond to those situations. Um, you can, there's two extremes of response. There's the people who they push through no matter what, and they try and tough it out. Um, and sometimes that can be helpful. And sometimes that can be really harmful as well. Um, and then there's the other extreme of people who they get a slight twinge of pain or a slight twinge of fatigue, and they'll completely back out of the race or they'll completely stop training. And that may or may not be helpful as well. So the two extremes of thought in response to pain and fatigue 
that they're, it's more beneficial to have a middle ground where you're looking at the contributing factors and going, oh, what's going on here? I'm fatigued. I'm really hot. I'm training or exercising way harder than I ever have. Maybe I do need to make some adjustments. Maybe I do need to slow down. Um, what is it happening in the context of the day? Is this the biggest race of your life? And you're probably, uh, you'll happily push through and risk uh, things happening because this is the thing you've been dreaming of. This is the thing you've been hoping and working towards. Or are you cramping on a Monday afternoon recovery ride? Then maybe um, you don't need to push yourself that hard. Or are you cramping in the first session of pre-season training um, of leading up to competition season? There's uh, the context around your decision making makes a big impact as well about, all right, uh, should I listen to my body back off a bit or am I okay to keep going? And it'll change situation to situation. And even how you're feeling in yourself is going to impact uh, those decisions as well. And we know that our psychological mood has a huge impact on pain and uh, lots of other uh, factors that go on in your brain. So it all as stress as well has a really big impact. So uh, putting all those together, all those really complex factors that make up uh, not just uh, how our muscles work, but how our whole body works is really important to understanding what to do in a given situation. I resonate with that uh, to the most extreme level possible because um, in my own experience with cramping, and I'm similar to that, I've really struggled with cramping in a lot of different scenarios and I've really experimented a lot with you and dad on different things, um, just like you've experimented a lot with dad. And I, it's probably a myth that you've just debunked there, Matt, which is that once you cramp, that's it. Like your, your body's done. That's what I used to believe. And I don't think that's necessarily true at all because in situations you can relax your body um, and you can, you know, stop that process of the, the muscles over firing and cramping. Um, and for me personally, uh, I used to think once my body cramped, that was it. I was done. I, I wasn't going to recover. I wasn't going to be able to perform anymore. Um, but the moment I, the one thing that actually helped me, uh, again, this is totally anecdotal, but I tried a lot of things, uh, especially in footy games. I used to cramp in the third quarter of every footy game and every game I tried something different. I tried different nutrition levels, different hydration levels, different tactics. And eventually the only thing that stopped it was just relaxing and not, not feeling so psychologically stressed about the cramp. Uh, and if the cramp came on, not thinking that that was it, you know, game done um, and just relaxing through the cramp and then I'll be able to play out the fourth quarter. And I think dad, you've had a similar experience like that experience with Warnable, you know, for a lot of people cramping at the hundred K mark would mean race over. Uh, and you said, no, I'm going to have to finish the race. So you, you chose a different tactic. Um, yeah, yeah. I really resonate with that hard. And, and Matt's, um, talk to talk to me through a lot of those things and I've been experimenting on some of our endurance uh, Saturdays during winter during COVID where we've been doing you know like the example I'm going to give you we, we started doing an endurance ride on the on the trainer indoor and to ride more than two hours on the indoor trainer in the last 10 years you would you would say someone's gone mad um, but you know I eventually went from two hours to three to four to five to six so so I've done six hours on an indoor trainer at reasonably high intensity and getting various levels of cramp throughout that period of four months on a Saturday. Um, and, and Matt suggested that I try things where I'm breaking the thought pattern from my head to my muscles. And that's what I concentrated on. A bit what you were talking about, George. Um, you know, I, I could feel the cramps coming on at certain parts during that Saturday endurance ride. And in that endurance ride, it had lots of high intensity in the in amongst the endurance we did races we we, you know, we had a rest and we did another race and we do hill repeats and and the thing that really helped me was to um try almost like you know, examples i'll give is if i use smelling salts so that I, my brain stopped concentrating on the cramp it took away my thought process about my muscles going to cramp or or i started chewing a little bit of whatever i had but i don't ever eat any food so again that's a foreign uh, example to the brain and it's saying, what are you doing now? You're eating. Um, or, uh, or the pickle juice, you know, you've got this sour taste on your mouth and the brain stops concentrating on the cramp pathway and was more concentrating on what the hell I'm doing to myself. That's, that's uh, tricking, almost tricking yeah. itself into well, well, what you're talking about there is something that, uh, goes on in a lot of, uh, pain research and a lot of, uh, pain uh practical pain strategies now in terms of using this stuff for cramp 
it's completely hypothetical. Like, uh, like you said, we're trying stuff, we're giving it a go, but these specific practical strategies haven't got a lot of evidence that I've seen behind them, but I'm more making links between, well, if this works in this scenario, how about we try it here and see what happens? Um, and I'm the first to admit that it's not going to work for everyone. But um, for example, if we're uh, talking about pain, uh, one of the things that we use in some of the chronic pain clinics I've worked in is the idea that your brain can only concentrate on so many things at once and you can only consciously concentrate on so many things at once. And so a really powerful technique we use with managing pain is mindfulness. So if you're constantly thinking about my knee sore, my knee sore, my knee sore, my knee sore, Jordan, how's your knee feeling? Yeah. You're focusing on how sore it is. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And if you're constantly focused on that, do you reckon that's going to make you relaxed or stressed? Absolutely stressed. Yep. And then combine that with, this is the biggest race day of your life. How's your stress levels? Yeah. Yeah. Through the roof. <laughs> so, um, one of the things we can do is like try and selectively draw your attention elsewhere. So for example, if you're competing in the biggest event of your life, um, one, a once in a lifetime achievement. So for example, Hawaii in Kona, dad, what are some of the other, incredible things about racing in Kona that you could tell us about apart from the agonizing pain of muscle cramping yeah uh, just being you know the the elite event the world cup of triathlon sort of thing you know the world cup of soccer you know it's it, you're know, so uh, grateful to be there to be to be selected to qualify there's so many good things um experiencing racing against the best in the world in age group or, or professionalism um the myth the myth of um of Kona itself, the lava fields. There's so many other things about that race um, that, mm. that, yeah, that, uh, you know, concentrating on winning the race and doing your best performance is one definite thing in my mind. But I, I did have a sense of um, uh, gratefulness to be able to be in that, in that unbelievably big race. Um, mm. And even if we go even more specific, looking at other senses, like, I'm sure if you cast your memory back, you could probably tell me some of the things you saw on the uh, running track when you were running out uh, in Hawaii and some of the um, incredible sights and like Hawaii is beautiful. So you must've had distinct sounds and smells and things you could see and look at as you were running on the pavement. Yeah. You, you would expect someone normal to answer yes, but, um, <laughs> but all I was focused on was what the pace I was running at was and yep and how my body was coping and i'm just yeah. really asking myself for feedback is this pace sustainable so mm. i understand what you're saying i do remember um seeing dave scott and uh, mark allen running the other direction in front of me and and thinking far out i'm not that far behind these guys um you know at the turnaround and and things like that i distinctly remember but they're all race mm. race yep. sort of things yeah but even that's an interesting example of selective attention and what you choose to focus on when there's so much happening around you um and so the theory we use in chronic pain is that by deliberately uh becoming more mindful of a particular aspect so we use breathing control as one uh really obvious conscious thing we do to draw our attention away from different areas of our body uh, or away from areas of pain can be really powerful to helping people relax and calm down and even if it doesn't necessarily change their pain, it helps them feel better about it and helps them feel a bit more comfortable in managing it moving forward. So I'd be, uh, and that's something that you've been trying uh, in relation to cramp. And like I said, this is totally experimental, but it's really interesting concepts to think about. So um, have, you f have you found it has any impact at all when you're going through a race and you're cramping or it doesn't make a difference? Um, in my training sessions, uh, definitely I can actually relax better and think about other things and not concentrate on the, the upcoming cramp that I can start. I can tell where it's coming, you know, and I think what we've said, both of us have said, you know, the anxiety levels build because I can already feel the twitches coming. Um, so that's when I'm consciously trying to distract my brain. Um, and it seems to work. Um, but if I was in a competitive race situation, I'm not sure I would be so calm and, <laughs> yeah. and so able to quickly, you know, just relax mm. myself and take the stress away from the situation. Yeah. Probably the biggest thing that helps cramping, and this is the thing that has the most evidence behind it, is static stretching. 
So you found uh, on the bike when you can stand up and do some calf stretches or other stretches on the bike, that helps really relieve things. And that actually has one of the, the strongest research behind it. So that's why you see AFL footballers when they're on the field and they start cramping up, they immediately jump into a stretch. Um, and what that does is it helps override some of the uh, mixed up neural signals you're getting uh, because obviously when you're cramping, your muscles shorten and contract. And so helping to lengthen your muscles actually sends a different signal from your muscle to your brain and vice versa. And it helps kind of interrupt that process. So this, the most uh, well-supported treatment for cramps is static stretching. Um, and look, I agree with that. And um, obviously you have to do a stretch anyway, because you've got to unlock the cramp. In the yeah. first place. So you can't, and I have tried to keep going with cramp locked and I've ended up tearing my calf muscle. Um, which is not ideal without trying to stretch it out. Um, <laughs> but, but I've been experimenting with, and I, I know from some of the high intensity sessions that I do, I get cramp at night in bed um, mm. later on. I don't get cramp in the race, I get it in bed. And if I haven't given myself the right fueling, nutrition, so I'm talking about drinks and food after the high intensity event that I've done, whether it's a Thursday night race or a Saturday uh, endurance day, if I haven't looked after myself really well post exercise, I will get the cramp, no problem. But if I do all those things like walk um, afterwards, get the blood flow around, eat the right fuel, drink the right hydration. And the third thing I do is I rub an exterior magnesium cream onto my calves. And I also take magnesium powder um, post event and the, the results have been remarkable. That's just a test on myself. Yeah. That's not and, That's and, from, and from what we've been talking about, a lot of those things that you try have no basis in evidence whatsoever. So yeah. whilst the overall package works for you individually, the research doesn't support a lot of those things in helping manage cramps. But I, what I can say, Matt, is if mm. I don't do those things, I will cramp all night. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the minute I do one of those things, I can go back to sleep. It, yeah. that, that to me is, it's a result. Yeah. And this is why cramps are so hotly contested and there's so much debate about what's going on. And it really does summarize that we don't know everything about cramping. Uh, be, what what I would... A, it could be a placebo that I've rubbed the cream on and now I feel better. Yeah. Because or even if we break it down further and we look at the different elements of fatigue. So uh, all of those things you've just suggested do help address fatigue. So for example, uh, adequate nutrition after a race will help address overall fatigue. Um, adequate warm down helps settle down your muscles, helps keep the blood flow moving, helps uh, move some of the um, buildup of chemicals that uh, are produced by the muscles when you're exercising, helps keep everything moving. Uh, so we know that a warm up and a cool down are really important uh, factors for racing and for events and for exercising in general. So uh, all those different factors you've said could be helpful. But uh, again, I just want to link it back to the research into cramping specifically uh, hasn't got a lot of association with some of the stuff that you've spoken about. Awesome. Do you have anything to finish off? And I'll, I'll actually add to that point that is uh, for me, the post nutrition has no impact on whether I keep cramping or not. I keep cramping during the night, whether I fuel myself to the T. Um, so that's my personal experience. So to finish off, Matt, do you have any final recommendations for what people could experiment or try? I mean, we've tried some wacky things ourselves with <laughs> purposefully turning the muscles on and off and that kind of thing. Uh, do you have anything yeah. else that people can try to manage it? I, I guess the research uh, in terms of preventing cramps, there's not a lot in the research that I found. Uh, when you do get a cramp, static stretching is the best thing for it. Uh, but in terms of stopping them from coming on at all, uh, I haven't found anything in my reading that has said you should or shouldn't do this in the lead up to it. Uh, I'd probably say overall, um, considering the link between uh, pushing yourself harder than you've trained and cramping or uh, high intensity exercise, the best thing you can do is train and train appropriately and train to your level and plan and prepare so you can perform at the level that you want to perform to. So if you know that you've got a big event coming up, then being as consistent and as diligent as you can with your preparation and your exercise and your training is probably going to be the best thing that contributes to you having a good race on the day. 
Perfect. That's a nice little subtle uh, reiteration of our motto there. I appreciate you putting that in. Uh, I think that's a perfect way to finish this podcast. Is there anything else you want to touch on, Dad, before we go? No, I, I, I just really wrapped it. Matt's been able to give us so much uh, really scientific-based uh, uh, information and and there's so many myths about cramping out there. Mm. And uh, Matt and I have talked long and hard about this many times um, on some of my walks that's gone for 45 minutes on what about this? What about trying this? And, and, you know, we're experimenting all the time and so are the researchers and, you know, there will be a time when we have a lot more knowledge about, about what to do about cramping and a, how to prevent it from in the first place. And then B, when you get it, what to do about it. And then, then post, you know, there's so many areas that, that we're still learning about. And that's what the message across to everybody who's listening is there is no one fix here. It's, it's, Mm. it's not, it's not what, what is available. And if it was, they would be, you know, very, very, very very well in in their careers. Yeah. They'd they'd be incredibly wealthy. Yes. Um, And I'll I'll just reiterate on that point as well. I I am no expert on this. Uh, All the opinions we've expressed today are mine and just from the reading that I've done. And so if anyone else has got uh, other stuff that they've heard about cramp, well, that'd be a great discussion to have. And that'd be a great uh, thing to have to talk about. But these are just my opinions from what I've read and from what the research I've come across says. So uh, that's the best we've got so far. And I'm sure there'll be plenty more research done into cramp in the future. And that's why we appreciate you coming on, Matt, because you always provide a lot of clarity and a lot of well thought uh, out opinions. Uh, We know that you don't form these opinions lightly. You do it from research and just uh, pretty good critical thinking skills. Uh, So we appreciate you coming on and uh, as we get more evidence or if any more research comes out into any of these topics, I'm sure we'll get you back on the podcast to provide an update to the listeners, but I'm sure they will appreciate at least some clarity around that. And, uh, you know, if from our own experiences, dad, you found a little bit of a concoction that works for you. Uh, for me, like I said, the best thing that works for me is relaxing uh, and being able to uh, be mindful, like Matt said, and um, relax my body. That's actually been the most effective for me. So uh, maybe for the athletes out there, it's uh, time for you to experiment and find what works for you. Yeah. That's uh, it for this I episode. Just add, I'm just trying to say one more thing, Jordan. I just think we really need to to keep that link between fatigue and cramping. Um, and, and once we, uh, in our mind, reconcile that, fatigue does contribute a lot to, to cramping then then that will inspire everybody to be m- more intent on the training sessions that are put in front of them and and you know the goal is to not cramp um, if you're a, if you are a cramper so so concentrating on uh, you know testing your body to get those fatigue levels and, and stress yourself so you get close to that with the intensity in training is going to put you in good stead come race day. Perfect. That's a great way to finish. Thanks very much for listening and we'll see you next time.